production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, follow along with a local photographer who has some possum subjects. Dogs have a variety of different expressions and I try and definitely elicit that when I'm working with them. A Columbus baker whips up tasty treats that were once reserved for royalty. You know, marshmallows have really fallen from grace. They were a confection for kings. And check out some old-timey valentines on display in Lancaster. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. So this is my fur baby, Penny. She's a two-year-old Bernese Mountain Dog. She's 100 pounds of love. She enjoys cold weather walks and long snoozes, and she loves mugging for the camera. But it would take a lot more than this cell phone pic to capture the depth of her personality. And that's exactly what Central Ohio photographer Lisa Browning aims to do. She literally makes it her business to document the special bond between humans and their four-legged friends. In our first story tonight, she shares some of her secrets to capturing the perfect portrait of your precious pet. Yeah, it looks good. My name is Lisa Browning, and I work with families whose favorite children have fur. Now, believe it or not, there is a flattering way to pose dogs. <laughs> The people who come to us to take pet portraits are people who really consider their dogs to be family members. These aren't just um, animals who live in their house. These are loyal companions who bring them unending joy. So when they're out there, we are really creating a moment we for go. them. Oh, we got a good head tilt. We are taking a picture, a photo shoot with the, the star of the day, Mr. Sheldon here. We believe he's a Papillon Italian Greyhound mix. Uh, we rescued him when he was eight months old uh, from Powell Animal Welfare Society and he is now seven and he is just the light of our lives. I mean, he's just everything to us. So we wanted to make sure that we have a lot of great memories. We take a lot of pictures on our phone. My phone is 90% Sheldon, but it's important to us to have really high quality professional photos. And once we saw Lisa's portfolio, it was just a no brainer. Oh my gosh, I couldn't even focus the camera when I got a first camera. Um, I never picked up a camera until 2014. I'm an attorney and I was practicing law here in Columbus. I had a baby and uh, decided that I could take his newborn portraits myself. And that was a terrible idea because I had no idea how to even focus a camera. But uh, I started practicing more and more and then um, I discovered I did not like photographing a newborn or a baby, but I started photographing my own dog. And um, it was really great. And then our uh, neighbors started asking me if I wanted to photograph their dogs and uh, it just kind of took over from there. In the very beginning, I taught myself from YouTube, and then I um, decided that I would take courses here in Columbus, and I've studied with um, a fashion photographer, and I've studied with a product photographer, and that's how I learned my lighting techniques, and I've applied them to dogs. One of the things when people call me up and uh, want to have their dog photographed, I definitely find out about their breed, if they're a mixed breed, if they're a purebred breed, because I want to better understand who it is that I'm going to meet and who I'm going to photograph. I would say that the biggest thing for a pet portrait is that you want to capture that dog's personality or that cat's um, essence, really. Dogs have a variety of different expressions and I try and definitely elicit that when I'm working with them. One of the things I'm really looking for is getting their ears perked. Because when their ears are hanging down, it looks like maybe they're a little tense, but when their ears are up, it looks like they're happy and alert. And that's really great for an expression. I feel really lucky that JJ and Phil 
chose me to photograph Mustang. I had photographed their um, other two dogs who are still with them, Gunner and Toby, a couple years ago. And they thought of me to capture Mustang's spirit since he's a rescue and he has become so very special as an addition to their family. Uh, so Mustang was a rescue that we got um, about a year ago um, from uh, the Madison County Humane Society. He was relinquished to the shelter um, and I didn't realize when he first walked into the clinic that he would actually be walking into my home and my heart. Uh, yeah, he is blind, um, but you wouldn't know it. It doesn't, doesn't slow him down at all. So. Oh my gosh, I don't know that I ever really try to get them to sit still. Um, sometimes they're standing, sometimes they're walking around. I have a lot of squeakers and duck calls and squirrel calls and things I picked up at Cabela's to get their attention. Sometimes they're just standing there and they're looking all over the place and they just look over at me and all I need is just that split second. Lisa just captures the beauty and the essence of our dogs. Honestly, before we did it back in 2016, I was a little bit skeptical as to what the difference would be, but it's amazing how well she catches like the emotions that they show. Ooh, I know when you know our go. dogs are gone, um, just how we'll look back with you know just just fantastic memories of, of these moments. So, and that's one of the things that makes photography so unique is that these images get more valuable with time because we can never get that day back. Oh my gosh, look at that head tilt. I retouch every portrait that is purchased. And um, one of my big things is that I always want the leeches removed in Photoshop so that you don't see those unsightly leeches in a, in a finished portrait that's gonna hang on your wall. I have a knack of getting every single power line that uh, is in existence in a park and I always remove those too. So you get a really beautiful, clean image. Dogs are just such beautiful souls and they just give us so much unconditional love and I feel so lucky that I am able to commemorate and celebrate the special bond that people have with their pets. Visit browningportraits.com to learn more about Lisa's pet photography business. You can also find her on Facebook. Valentine's Day is right around the corner, which means it's the season of bonbons, candy hearts, and boxes of chocolates. One of my favorite seasons. But local confectioner Michelle Allen likes to think outside that heart-shaped box with her signature marshmallow treats. Here's her story. We are in my new cafe, my confectionery cafe, Mellow Boutique Confections, M-M-E-L-O, which funnily enough came out of a sound that my husband would hear because I, I started kind of doing this in Spain and my husband, people would try my food and people would go, hmm, and it just kind of grew out of that sound. So yeah, that's where Mellow comes from. You know, marshmallows have really fallen from grace. They were a confection for kings. And the reason for that is you can do so many things with the flavor and the texture and the, the you know, you raise it a few degrees and you get like this, a Swedish marshmallow, which is a bit rubbery and that's how they like it. Or, you know, you add a bit of egg white to it and it's like a, it's almost like a foam. The French call that a gouy mauve. So that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of pushing the, the virtues of marshmallows. I grew up just off of Livingston Avenue and the southeast side and went to Ohio State and was just chomping at the bit to get out of town. I traveled all over the world and a lot of that travel actually ended up informing the recipes I design now. In September of, of 2015, I quickly came back to, to the United States, incorporated Mellow contacted a, a, a contact that I had over at Easton Ownership. They gave me this creme de la creme spot on the Strand. I had Louis Vuitton across the street and, you know, Apple on one side or Michael Kors on the other. It was mad. That would never in a million years happen in Europe. I was there for eight weeks. Based on the strength of that, I got corporate clients I got. Um, I found the funding for my business. I would never have gotten this far in Spain, ever. Part of, the, um, part of the research that I've done in, in, in food is really trying to make sure that, that I and my team really understand 
why you make the ingredient choice that you make and how that basically interacts with the human body. That in addition to the, the commitment to using, designing all the recipes around, you know, real food, whole food ingredients, not using uber refined flours, not using uber refined sugars, not using artificial flavors or sweeteners or, you know, all the sort of stuff that we now know we shouldn't really consume. You know, people will ask me all the time, can you do a, a sugar-free treat? And my response to that is, I would love to, but there isn't a natural way to do that. You know, we can do low glycemic, but we can't do sugar-free. I'm not trying to say that Mellow is, is health food, but it is food. It is not junk. It is not made with junky ingredients. There's, there's thought behind the way that it was built and constructed. And a lot of people here in Columbus have done some amazing work in terms of creating the, the food landscape here in, in Columbus. It's, it's, it's so impressive and I'm so proud of my hometown and I really hope that Mellow can contribute to that in a, in a, in a, in a really positive way. Follow Mellow on Instagram, or better yet, pop into their storefront to sample some of their beautiful and tasty treats. You can find them nestled between North Market and the Convention Center. The tradition of giving your sweetheart a written love note on February 14th dates way back before Hallmark. In fact, the oldest valentine on record is a poem written in the 1400s. But the mass-produced factory-made cards that we're all familiar with today have a much more recent past. They've only been around since the 19th century, when they started to replace all those handmade and handwritten love notes. I sat down with local collector George Johnson in Lancaster to talk about this tradition and how it's evolved through the ages. George, so you're a bit of a Valentine historian in a way, right? Yes. So tell me about your collection. How did you get started with this? I started collecting in the 1970s, and I, I really admired the artwork and the, you know, how, how lovely they were. I started collecting what collectors today call fold-down Valentines that, that pull down and open up oh, cool. into beautiful scenes. Mm -hmm. You weren't just going to the drugstore and buying valentines. No, How no. are you finding these? I was buying them at antique shows mm -hmm. and antique shops, and places like that, you know, flea markets. A lot of times valentines have been saved for many, many years. I have several in the collection that are all 200 years old wow. and still in good shape. Do you have any concept of how many you've collected and how your collection has grown over the years? Um, not really. <laughs> But there's probably two, three hundred um, wow. Valentines on display here. So much love, <laughs> it's kind of great. That's right. This particular one is the earliest one that we have uh, in the collection. So this one is essentially, you know, 200 years old. Wow. On the back, then, is the handwritten. That's handwritten. Poem. Our penmanship skills have gone yes. down. <laughs> Like this, many waters cannot quench love. This one, it dates from the 1840s, and um, it has perforated lace on it, it has satin in the center, and it's a very lovely card, but the most interesting part, at least to me, is that each of these wreaths, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and each of these will lift to reveal a little, little message, message mm -hmm. behind it. That's so cute. And everyone, except Sunday, because Sunday, Sunday. is for church, and church we're and not going to do any right. of that <laughs> hanky panky type stuff. <laughs> and these little envelopes. And then each one of the six days of the week that are listed here wow. has a little tiny envelope. That doesn't open. And it opens. Oh, stop. And inside is another small message. handwritten message. Um, this one is from the 1870s, probably, and uh, it's, it's gilded, perforated lace paper. It's very unusual in the sense that the back is just as decorated oh my gosh, as the front, it is. 
with a, um, uh, that's a spun glass um, medallion what? in it. That's amazing. And this is the hidden picture. Okay. You want to take that other side, we'll open it up. To see There's the a little couple. The inside. Running away together. So this is a, what they call the trick valentine. So we've got a little silk cord with a little piece of uh, silvered um, cardboard on it. And when you pull the string, it lifts up into a three-dimensional form with a little love note at That's the top. That's beautiful. How elaborate. Let oh go of it and it lays flat. So it'll go through the mail like that. Right. And then, you know, simply pulling the string. And what lifts era it is up. this from? This again is probably 1870s, maybe wow. 1880s. So intricate. The majority of the display here runs from 1820 to um, 1930s, 40s, mm -hmm. um, but there's a few that, you know, younger kids will recognize too. Valentine's from George Johnson's collection will be on view at the Decorative Arts Center in Lancaster for a limited time only. Visit DecArtsOhio.org to learn more. Our next story takes us up to Detroit, where Michigan artist Jennifer Lanzalotti is always turning over a new leaf with her novel ideas. You're working on a canvas that is part of the earth. And then if I paint on this leaf, I'm giving a piece of earth back to somebody. So I actually don't have a background in art. It's really funny. My background is in social work. I gave up social work to be home with my kids, and that's when I started writing. So I wrote some action-adventure romance, and I kind of did it with the idea in mind that my kids would read it one day. They're kind of the movies that I had going through my head that I thought, I need to get this on paper. The series is called Heal Me, and the first book is Heal Me, and the second book is Healed. And it's actually about a woman who has the ability to heal. And so at a time when terrorists have hit nuclear power plants, a government agent is sent to find her and bring her in, and he ends up learning that this person's not who the world thinks she is. For uh, Chicory Island, there's an organism in the water, and it's the fear of if something happens to our drinking water, to the Great Lakes. And I'm obviously a big nature person. <laughs> I love nature so much, and I'm all about like protecting the water and the Great Lakes. And I spent years writing as a stay-at-home mom, and I'd never painted before, ever in my life. And the opportunity to paint on leaves literally fell on my car. <laughs> I parked my car under a maple tree and it was in the fall. And when I came outside, my car was blanketed with maple leaves. So the opportunity was right there. So I picked one up and I remember thinking, this is flawless. And I thought, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna just try painting. And I honestly didn't even have any good paint. I didn't have a good paintbrush. And I realized for the first time that I'm really drawn to landscapes. And it was a learning process for me. I can collect 100 leaves, and out of all those leaves, only 50 of them are gonna be worthy. So I bring them home. I soak them in the sink and water and then I dry them with paper towel and I press the leaves. I have a really good friend who made me this really great leaf press. I wait the three weeks and then when they're completely dry and I'm happy with it, I'll take it outside and I'll spray it with like a protective spray and then, then it's ready to be painted. I have always loved nature and the idea of bringing nature inside. It's almost nostalgic, a leaf, you know, fallen from the earth. 
And so you're collecting a leaf that has died and you're giving it life. It's being reborn in the form of a painting that will be forever preserved on someone's wall. And I love that idea. So once I released this inner artist that I obviously always had, but didn't know it until recently, um, I started viewing everything differently. And I'm obsessed with trees. I love birch trees. The initial is to look at something and that inspires me, but by the time I'm done with it, I have gone off in a totally different direction. I've added my own twist to it and it's all just almost like beginner's luck. Every day I'm inspired, I want to paint or I want to write. I'm, I'm writing another story. It's like creativity overload. There's so much I want to do. I started doing bottles, you know, I ran out of leaves and then I thought, well, let me paint on a bottle. Make it one continuous scene around the bottle. My friend gave me the idea to turn them into incense bottles. It works, it makes a really nice incense bottle. It's also a bottle that you would have just thrown away, so the same concept, you're repurposing it, recycling a bottle. <laughs> Pallet wood is really popular right now. And I remember thinking like, I wonder if I could paint on canvas something that would look like pallet wood. And so I took the canvas and I made a stencil and I painted it and worked on it all afternoon. And when it was done, it actually did look like painted pallet wood. I think somewhere with being a mom and a parent, I dropped the idea of I can't. I, when I used to maybe look at something, oh, I could never do that. But now I have this attitude of, hey, all I can do is try. I don't know if I can do it, but I'm, it's, I'm gonna try it. And so I did, and it's one of the things I'm most proud of. Out of all the things I've ever done, I, it took me like 30 some hours to do, and tons of paint. I'm still in the beginning stage where if you really like my art enough to wanna hang it in your house, I'm just thrilled to pieces. More than anything, I think I'm really grateful that I was able to be a stay-at-home mom because that gave me the extra time. And this is a discovery for me. I don't ever want to quit painting. I want to keep going and pursuing it. I'm just so grateful that I have this. I would definitely like to keep selling and I'd like to get my books published and I would like to really get my name out there. I'd just be happy to have more than 100 followers on Instagram, to be honest. <laughs>
goodness. It's a very long handwritten poem, as you can see, but this poem is a very dark poem. Oh, really? This is not the typical love poem of how much I love mm -hmm. you and will you be mine. This one is eight stanzas long and it gets darker as it goes on. It's mm. to Rebecca and it's a very dark poem and I'll read you just like the first three lines to it. Tis time the wing of sorrow had cast a shade upon my brow and my drooping eyes looked out from the deep gloom that shrouded it and it gets deeper and deeper and into a very melancholy dark um, poem. It's intense. Um, it is intense. But and, still it's uh, beautiful. And essentially it says that if you won't be mine, marry me, Yikes. I can't live and I will die. That's a lot of pressure for Rebecca. Yes, it's mm. a lot of pressure for Rebecca. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.